Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, this talk is really a collection of topics, okay, that have some, some cohesion. They somehow tie together. Uh, it's not readily apparent in the beginning how they kind of tie together, but the way that I kind of like to look at this is that these are many of the things that I kind of wish I knew early on in software development that really people don't seem to talk very much about these days. And it's kind of unfortunate because many of these things really do affect the way that you look at design. They affect the way you look at how you're going to approach particular problems in software development. And um, I guess what we'll do is we'll just kind of march through these things. Some of these things you may know already. Others may be new to you. And I hope that you find this rather enlightening. One thing that uh, is rather striking in software development is that we have some some interesting preconceived ideas about the way software should be structured, okay? Uh, how many people have heard the adage that methods should be small, right? Okay, yeah, so that's great. Should all methods be small? It's nice, but one thing that's very, very interesting is that when you actually start to go and gather statistics in real world projects, you discover that there is something a little bit more more interesting going on than just saying, okay, well, you know, a project happens to be bad if all the methods don't happen to be small. And it's really this, power law distributions. You've heard about these at all? Okay. They're getting more and more play now within the, um, within the development community. People are hearing a lot more about this concept. Um, you can see power laws in many different natural phenomena. Okay. Here's a power law distribution. Like, uh, for instance, taking a look at airports. It's kind of like, you know, usually with an airport, there are a small number of airports which receive many, many incoming flights, right? And there's lots of little satellite airports which don't really have much in the way of incoming and outgoing flights. It tends to be the case that people really, you know, they tend to bias towards flying towards the hubs. Why would they fly toward the hubs? Well, in general, because you can get someplace else from the hubs, right? So you tend to have like this built-in favoring towards hubs when you're going and dealing with airports. You choose to go through Heathrow even though you don't like Heathrow because it's just easier to get to where you need to go. The same type of curve, curve tends to go in um, occur within things like wealth distribution in society, right? That there are quite often in many societies some people who have an awful lot of wealth and a lot of people who don't quite have, you know, quite as much. Um, now, it's funny because you can look at these things and say, well, you know, really, what's the commonality between these things? And it's not readily apparent. But it gets even more, you know, puzzling in a sense when you look at software development as well. Um, take method size in a typical project. And I've done this on some projects I've worked on. If you take a look at method size in a project, what you'll find is that you have lots and lots and lots of little methods, left-hand side over here, and then it kind of tapers down. You end up having some big methods which are bigger and other methods which are bigger, and then as you keep on going out to the right, you find fewer and fewer methods that have you know, extreme length, right? And uh, it's kind of funny. Why does that happen in software development? I'm not sure anybody really knows at this point. You know, one thing that tends to be true about power law distributions is that they tend to be things which really kind of um, result from uh, iterated uh, preferential attachment, okay? It's like with the airport. You say, okay, well, you know, if I want to go from X to Y, easiest way is to go through the hub, which has many flights in and out, and that's the most economical way of approaching things. I don't see quite what it is with methods right now. Um, it seems with methods, though, that we do have some kind of an inbuilt bias towards creating small methods, in spite of the fact that we know that we don't always do this. In a typical project, you will find that there are many, many small methods. You'll have a large number of one-line methods, a smaller number of two-line methods, smaller yet number of three-line methods. And as you taper all the way down, you'll find you know, the monstrosities that we're all aware of, 3,000-line methods, 4,000-line methods. But it tends to be true that you have this distribution across many different projects. And so you go and you ask yourself, well, gee, you know, is that right? Should all methods really be small if we end up having projects where we always have like one or two you know, 1,000 line methods? I don't know, it's kind of funny, but the thing to point out though is that with the power law, it's still a power law if you basically go ahead and alter the parameters. You may have a very, very small number of lar large methods, and that's okay, but still you'll end up falling out into this kind of distribution, which is kind of interesting to think about, okay, that there really is this, this thing which happens across uh, all of your software. Same thing tends to be true for the sizes of other entities within a software project. You know, the Size of classes. We tend to have lots of small classes, you know, a fewer bigger ones, and then as we go and march on, we have the god classes. And they, in essence, I guess, kind of act like hubs for our design, right? The big abstraction that everybody goes and adds methods to and then delegates out from. And we end up having like this tree like structure, lots of very, very big methods, you know, or big classes on the right side, 
Um, I mean, not too many big classes on the right side, but many, many small classes on the left-hand side. This doesn't get enough play, but it's an interesting thing to know about software. In general, I love small methods, but the thing is I'm probably not going to be too surprised if I find a couple of big ones because that just kind of falls into the, the natural urge that software tends to have. And I'm not sure we quite know why it is that way right now, but it's still something which is kind of great to know. If you ever get a chance, there's a project called The Shape of Java, um, which is uh, done by several researchers in New Zealand and Canada. One of them is James Noble, and it's basically this long treatise that goes and describes how they found power law-like distributions across many different projects, open source and closed source. And they were able to go and basically see that there is a natural form that software takes. You know, there is better software, but there's also software which isn't quite so good. And you are able to go and see the distributions and see how things kind of play out in real software projects. And I think it's probably going to be something very useful to us over time to think about is like we have our prescriptions for what good design is, but it's also kind of interesting to go and ask ourselves, what are the real forces behind bad design? What are the force, real forces behind mediocre design? And what, do, what can we really expect overall in a very large project? I think a little bit more investigation into this will help, but I think it's important for us to be aware of these concepts. Another thing which um, I think is rather deep and people are getting a bit more of these days is really the notion that you can see everything in an object-oriented way if you choose to. Now, this is really kind of a funny thing to talk about because, you know, I don't know for some of us we just kind of take it for granted that everything is kind of object-oriented if you look at it in a particular way. But really, how deep does that go? Um, Y'all are familiar with Smalltalk? You ever see the Smalltalk programming language? One of the great things about Smalltalk is that it was objects all the way down. And things that you wouldn't even normally think of as being object-oriented, for instance, really were implemented with objects all the way down. Uh, one thing that was really kind of startling to me when I first heard about it was the fact that control structures really are not built into the language. All they are really is message sends among objects. So what do we have here? Okay, here we have um, a conditional expression in Smalltalk. We have a Boolean variable there. And we're sending in the message if true, if false. And that's just how you do things in Smalltalk. What does this do? If true, if false is a compound message that has two keywords, if true and if false, and it accepts blocks for each one of those things. So that little thing inside there, transcript show, true, false. Um, what this is is basically saying, oh, I just want to show this on the console. I just want to show the, you know, that we have true or false within this. So how does this work? Well, as I said, it's objects all the way down. So you're sending a message to an object, okay? And that object needs to know, well, gee, am I going to go ahead and execute this one block or execute the other? How does this work? Well, it turns out there's a class called Boolean. There's two different other classes, which are subclasses of Boolean called true and false. And what do they do? Well, if you look at the if true method on the false class, it accepts a true block and it accepts a false block. And what happens is that basically the, it returns the value of the false block if, um, if false is the receiver of that message. If true is the receiver of that message, what it does is it goes and receives the, it returns the value of the true block. It executes the true block and returns its value back. So in essence, conditional behavior, control flow itself, is basically implemented as polymorphic dispatch in Smalltalk. Anybody ever see this before? Okay, this is really kind of powerful and profound when you think about it. You can do anything in Smalltalk basically through the, the veil of objects. You can basically see computation entirely through this. Um, Ruby does a little bit of this. Smalltalk, you know, it's like this code is within the Smalltalk images when you look at Smalltalk images. But for the most part, what happens is that this stuff is really hard coded into the language runtime because they realize that taking the hit of a polymorphic dispatch for doing this might be a little bit too, uh, too intense in terms of. Um, uh, you know, in terms of you know, being aware of performance in, in big applications. So they basically kind of burn it into the image, but essentially you can look at the code and see how it could be implemented this way. And in fact, in some small tech images, they do really implement it this way, so you have the ability to, to change these things if you want to. But you can basically go ahead and dream up any control flow construct that you want to and implement it right there within the language itself. Rather interesting. Anybody know that C is object-oriented? The C programming language? You do. OK, cool. Okay, you're the, you don't have anybody else that's agreeing with you yet, though. OK, well, let's talk about that. Okay? Procedural SOO. You can look at all procedural languages as being object-oriented in a sense. Okay? And this is really kind of an interesting mental trick to play with yourself. Take any C program that you have and imagine enclosing the entire 
program itself inside of an object, right? Imagine going and saying, hey, you know, I've got this class called object, and I've got all my declarations of functions. I've got all my global variables, and they're part of this class. And I've got all my functions. And since I'm in this object, I don't really have to go and dereference things with this. But it all kind of runs in a way, right? Now, I don't know that this is truly syntactically true that you can. I mean, I've seen small examples where people just say, hey, let's take some C code and wrap it in an object and go and do things with it. But when you think about it, though, this is really rather profound in a way because you can look at objects as being kind of like individual programs in a way, right? You can say, look, this is a program where basically we have access to all the other bits of our program and then we can have a separate program which is wrapped in another object and we have to go and dereference to get over, kind of jump over the fence and get to the other part of our program. Okay, in essence, really objects are namespacing. Um, anybody here works in Ruby at all? You ever play with Ruby? Very interesting programming language. One of the things that's kind of neat is that when you're using the Ruby interpreter, when you choose to go and write a method and say like, well, I define method add, for instance, and you go and you add values into it, and you do that in the Ruby interpreter, it looks like you have a free-floating method. But is that true? What actually happens with the Ruby interpreter, though, is that you are really working inside of the class object when you're actually in the Ruby interpreter. And when you add a, a method called add, for instance, that actually becomes part of the object object. Now, what's kind of funny about this is that any other code that you write is also part of the object object. And it's able to go and dereference these things without going and talking to self or this because it's like we're all in the same namespace, so to speak. So in a way, you can kind of look at objects themselves as being namespaces, kind of like being a separate area of code. And really, a lot of the stuff that we've done in procedural programming over the years really is object-oriented if you look at it that way. A um, little saying to go and basically use in conjunction with this is that, you know, yeah, all procedural programs are object-oriented. It's just a shame you only get one object, right? All the code really lives in that one particular namespace. Types. Sometimes people think that types don't matter in dynamic programming. How many people work here in dynamically typed programming languages? Some people do. A lot of people don't. I know this is a very big Microsoft crowd. And um, you know there are, I mean, let's see, you kind of skirted it a little bit. You had some dynamic typing in Visual Basic, right? But a lot of people kind of turn it off, OK? Um, the other thing, too, is I know that dynamic is being added as a keyword in C Sharp, right? So you can go and use a little bit of dynamic typing there. The thing about dynamically typed languages, which people forget quite often, is that the types still exist, even though the compiler isn't really checking them for you. And this gets back to a rather computer science-y way of looking at types, which is something that people don't really think about enough. In essence, when you start reading textbooks on computer science, one of the things you start to discover is this, that there is a notion of what a type is in computer science. And what a type is really is a set of values. Okay? So if we look at this, we can say that really ints in a 32-bit system you know, they are really a set of values. Okay? It's basically all x such that x is within this particular range. And it's very helpful to go and think about things in that way when you think about things like covariance and contravariance in and, and classes to kind of recognize that you know, you're really always asking yourself, is the set of values that I have here a superset or a subset of the set of values that I have here? And when you think about things in those terms, then you can think about what's possible as an error and what isn't possible as an error. Now, it's funny. We're used to thinking about this thing in terms of like the width of integers, right? You have a 64-bit integer and you have a 32-bit integer. Can you assign to this thing without overflowing and causing a problem? But the same type of set-based reasoning is something you can use for just about all the programming that you do. Okay? Think about interfaces, for instance. Okay? We have an interface here, and it, has, it doesn't really have a set of values, but what it does do is it does have a set of methods. And really, the applicability of a particular interface in a context really has to do with whether the context expects more of these methods or a subset of these methods in that particular place in your code, right? It's fine for us to go and pass an interface in a dynamically typed language, or pass an object in a dynamically typed language, which has a superset of all the methods that are expected in the context where we're using it. Um, but if we don't pass something which is a superset, then we might have a compile time, or not a compile, a runtime error in our, pro error in our program, right? So in essence, when you think about it, all of this is really set-based reasoning, okay, when you're trying to think about what is correct in a dynamically typed language. Sometimes people don't really ever get to this insight, though. They just kind of recognize that, well, you know, you've got an account class, and I've got my savings account subclass, and I kind of know that I can pass savings accounts in context where I have accounts. And, you know, they kind of have to start thinking about the fact that protocol matters, right? Even if you don't have an explicit interface like this, 
you're always thinking in terms of what messages can a particular object respond to in a particular context. And again, that comes back down to the set, the set of the methods which are understood in this particular context, just like the set of values which are understood in a particular context. Okay? So it's a rather different way of looking at programming, but it does end up going and paying you some dividends when you think about the possibility of errors, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in code. Sweetness is painful. Anybody agree with that? Well, yeah, it's one of those things which is kind of funny because I haven't really defined what sweetness is, right? What is sweetness, okay? This is a term that I use for a very particular style of design that we see sometimes. And my favorite example of this is the hair dryer in your hotel room. How many people are staying in a hotel room? Okay, right. So, you know, in most hotel rooms, you have this hair dryer. And it's kind of neat, but it isn't really something you go and grab from one room and plug in inside your bathroom and use. It has a wall mount, right? It has a, a set where you can go and place it inside the, um, the wall. And usually what happens with this is that you turn it on and everything is fine, but when you plus it, plug it into the handle that you have in the wall, what happens? It turns off, right? Most of the time. At least you hope it turns off, right? Or else you have air you know, blowing all through your bathroom and stuff like this. But this is really an example to me of what sweetness is. Sweetness is something which happens in design where you end up having one mechanism that ends up serving two purposes for you, okay? In this case, we have the wall mount for the hair dryer, and it's kind of like it serves as a place that you can go and put your hair dryer. It also serves as a thing which turns it off for you because these are two gestures which end up being rather useful for you, you know, in the context of the problem. Now, this is really related to some broader concepts which people have talked about in other engineering disciplines, but we don't really hear much about within software development. And it's really like the notion of engineering elegance, okay? Sometimes you'll see this kind of thing in other, like in construction and places like that, where you get this, this sense when you look at the engineering feat that they've solved that they, they did this in a particularly, a particularly elegant way. And often it comes down to this notion of economy. It's kind of like, given the constraints that they had, they basically found this space within the design which basically allows them to go and solve the problem using as few materials as possible. So there's this notion, in essence, of like economy, of, of going and just kind of tying things together in a nice way. But does that work for us in software? It's kind of funny. Um, is it good to go and mingle a bunch of different responsibilities in the same class? I mean, how many responsibilities should a class have? Yeah, I mean, in general, it's good to go and have a class which has a single focused responsibility. And why, why is that useful? The main reason why that's useful, the reason why that's rather important is because of maintenance, right? If we have commingled responsibilities and we need to go and change one of them, the chances of us impacting code in the other responsibility is rather high. So to the degree that we really have things mingled together, we really are in an odd situation. So I think software is a little bit different than most other engineering disciplines where you, you try to go and basically get this multifunction use out of a single item. Because we really want to separate things. We want to be able to separate things so that we can maintain them independently and not have impact when you touch one thing upon another. But, you know, then we get into this issue of what we call over-engineering sometimes, right? The notion that, you know, in a particular system, if we have thousands and thousands of classes, maybe we could have done with fewer classes. We could have had fewer classes and solved the same problem. But I think that for us, things like the single responsibility principle, the notion that we should have a single responsibility per class, are really endemic to the type of work that we're doing, okay? That allows us to get a degree of variation in our code that we couldn't have otherwise. So this is a nice thing to kind of try for, but you have to really basically pay attention to um, how it impacts maintenance in the context of the code that you have. Okay, so let's talk about something else. This is a rather interesting topic. The notion that you cannot make software more correct with redundancy. Okay, what is this? Let's think about some other engineering disciplines. Civil engineering. Okay, how does that work? Okay. Um, there's this um, book by Henry Petrowski about engineering, and he talks a bit about the history of bridge design in, uh, in the history of the world. And one of the things that he talks about is how, you know, the safest thing for engineers to do is to just kind of basically build them stronger next time, right? It's kind of like you can go through the computations to go and figure out how, you know, how much material you need to go and basically go ahead and support a certain number of cars going across the bridge and things like that. But it's like, you know, we also have the test of time. We've seen older bridges. We see how they wear. 
um, if we basically go ahead and build them stronger than the last time through, then you know we have fewer accidents, and that's you know a nice thing to have: fewer accidents and in, in, um, in construction and, and use. So that seems like it should work in software also, right? How can we build redundancy into applications? It's kind of weird. Turns out there was this thing that was kind of popular for a period of time, and you still see this in some mission critical systems. They're just living with the they're living with the effect, the um, limitations of it. There was an idea called inversion programming. And the idea was this. You can build redundancy into a system. You can build fault tolerance into a system by going and s passing the same spec to several different teams, okay, and having them implement the spec independently. And then in your software, what you do is you run all n versions of this stuff at once, right? And I believe this is the way the fly-by-wire system in uh, Boeing aircraft works, if I'm not um, mistaken. Um, so it's a rather neat idea. I mean, doesn't it make sense that if you basically give the same spec to different groups that you're going to go and basically, you know, one group goes and makes a mistake, then, well, you know, chances are the other group didn't make the mistake and, and everything's going to be okay, right? Seem like a decent idea? Well, it turns out that this really had a hole blown in it in a paper in 1986 by um, Knight and Levison. They basically found through experimentation that if you give the same spec to a bunch of different teams and have them work on it independently, you still have statistical correlation of the defects, okay? Teams will statistically make the same errors, okay? Now, the thing is, you still get some benefit out of this, but it is not as perfect as people thought it was, okay? And still, you will see mission-critical systems where they do that. They go and they run n versions of the software in parallel, and they kind of vote. It's like, oh, well, if three out of five basically arrived at the same answer, that's the one we're going with, okay? But, you know, we just don't get any place with redundancy, okay, in software development. We can't go ahead and build things stronger, right? We have to build them correctly. We can't go ahead and try to use statistics in order to go and make things stronger. And this is very different from what we're used to in other disciplines. And it's a thing which I think is really worth outlining. Um, and you look at other things, too, like in civil engineering and, and mechanical engineering. You know, what causes failures in mechanical engineering? Could be defects in materials. Could be use in really strange ways. What causes defects in software? Programmers, right? When it comes to the logic of the system, that stuff is not going to break until we touch it, right? It's going to do what it was doing before, okay? If we coded it correctly, it's going to always work correctly. There is no wear and tear in software, right? It all comes down to us. So we basically bear this incredible responsibility for writing correct code, and there's not much you can do with techniques like this to go and basically build things stronger, okay? And I think that this really impacts us deeply within the context of our discipline. Another thing, protection. Okay, protection to me is a social problem, not a technological problem. What do I mean by that? So if you're working in .NET, you have sealed. Anybody ever use sealed on things? Yeah, are you happy with it? Yeah, it's kind of useful. I mean, in Java world, we have final. What does final do? You can apply final to a method or a class, and what that means is you can either you can't subclass that class if it's final. You can't override that method if it's final. And um, the same thing is true of sealed in .NET. You basically have built something in such a way that you cannot change it through derivation. Okay? Is that good? Well, it's great until you actually do want to change those things. right? The funny thing is that basically using these particular protection mechanisms is nice. It's handy. But the thing that's tough about them is that you can't really break the lock very easily. Okay? I don't know if you've run into this situation much, but periodically I'm going out and I'm helping teams try to get tests in place around existing code. And um, <coughs> one of the things that happens quite often is we're looking at something which is from some API from some company, and we say, well, gee, you know, this class is using that class, but we don't really want to use it in the context of this test. And well, guess what? Oh, shoot, they made it sealed. What can we do? We can't even really subclass to go and get past this issue. We're kind of locked into using this particular thing. And, you know, you can understand why people do this sort of thing because they feel like, well, look, you know, if we didn't make it sealed, then somebody might go and subclass it and change behavior in a way which is insecure in our application or change behavior in such a way where they cause trouble and then they end up blaming us for it. So when you're designing APIs, APIs you often think about how to protect yourself, how to go and sort of tie particular things down. 
But that's fine until you get to the situation where it's like, well, gee, you know, somebody really does have a real legitimate need to go and solve that problem, and they can't really go and do it because you've locked the API down in particular ways. Now, there's a funny thing about this, though, and it, what it really comes down to for me is the notion that, yes, we can use these protection mechanisms, and yes, they are good, but they're really only good when the people that we're giving the code to can have some control over these things. Because sometimes it's hard for us to anticipate all the cases where we might want to go and protect things and um, never let anybody have any access at all. Um, one team that I worked with a long time ago, <coughs> they were a very big company. They had many, many different Java teams. And we were trying to go and get some tests in place around some code that they had. And they had all these separate jar files and all these separate packages. And I said, you know, if you made this particular class public, then what we could do is we could go ahead and we can start to go and write some tests in this particular area of the code base. They said, no, no, we can't do that. We can't make it public. And I'm like, why not? You make it public and everything will be okay. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand. If we make this public, there's some guys in another building down the street that will start to use that thing, even if we tell them not to. And if they start to use it, we can't change it at all. Sound familiar? Anybody ever see that situation at all? Okay, now the thing is, I turned to them and I said, okay, well, the issue is you have a social problem, not a technological problem. And you're asking technology to solve the social problem for you, and you're paying for it, okay? If you basically try to use language mechanisms to go and really tie down particular areas of your code and enforce certain design constraints, and people can't get out of those particular constraints, it's really kind of an odd thing. What you're doing is you're, you're substituting um, this enforcement mechanism for something which really should be a matter of agreement and cooperation across an organization. And when you think about it, if you can't even really get two teams in an organization to cooperate on something as simple as, as choosing not to use pr some particular bit of API, you know, what hope do they really have of cooperating on the bigger things, which are encompassing software development? Okay? So you know, this really goes all the way down the gamut of things. I think that these particular mechanisms, like sealed and final and protected and private, these are things that we should use. We can use these things in good context, but we need to be really aware of what happens when we give code to people who might have different needs for our code. We have to basically build in mechanisms to allow us to go and get access when we need things for, need access for testing and things along those lines. Um, another story related to this, singletons. Anybody ever used the singleton design pattern? Yeah, do you like it? I always ask that. You know, it's kind of like it's a neat pattern and stuff, but it does get in the way in testing sometimes because, you know, what do you do? Singleton goes and enforces a single instance for you, and that's kind of good and everything until you need to replace it. And replacing it under test is really an important thing quite often. You want to be able to replace the instance if it controls mutable state in your code so that you can go and start with a fresh, fresh state every time that you run one of your unit tests. Okay? So sometimes I visit teams and I say, okay, well, one thing that we can do is we can go and add a static method on your single one called set instance. Right? Is that okay? So, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, pff, yeah, sure, okay, we can do that, that's no problem. And other people look in there kind of like, ah, you broke singleton. Singleton is this design pattern which enforces the creation of a single instance, and now you've let anybody in the world go in there and call set instance, okay? And that's true, it's possible. Then I say, well, why don't we go ahead and name it set testing instance? And it's like, okay, yeah, we can call it set testing instance. And I make the argument then, you know, really, if you call it set testing instance, and you still have to worry about people in your organization calling set testing instance in production code, it's all gonna be messed up no matter what you do. Seriously, I mean, you cannot, if you can't trust people on your team not to call set testing instance in production code, how can you count on anything at all, right? So, the thing to point out about this though is that really protection is something that we need quite often in software development, but we have to think about the scope of protection. And the scope of protection is something which is really organized around social criteria in essence, right? If you have a team of people that you trust and everybody knows what the rules of engagement are for the code base, they know, you know how to interact with it, they know what they should do and what they shouldn't do, then basically going and foregoing a little bit of protection is actually a rather decent thing to do, okay? Um, but if you're going and giving your code to some other team, which really, you know, you can't really count on because you don't know them all that well, you might want to go and set the rules of engagement with them and, you know, maybe, maybe you have to go and protect yourself. Maybe you don't. There's a very typical thing that happens, you know, quite often in software development, and it's um, when you're developing code for somebody else, you know, in a different organization. You're in organization A, you develop software that's going to be used by organization B, and you're selling it to them, right? And then you say, okay, well, you know, I can have this part of the API, and I can make it public for testing or some other reason, 
and just go ahead and tell them, you know, just don't use this, please. You know, this is something we basically go and ex we expose for our own, ex you know, internal use. And then they start using it. And then you're kind of like, well, you know, we told you not to use it, right? And then they say, well, you know, we had to use it. And we felt like we wanted to use it. And then you get mad. And what you do is you say, look, okay, we're just going to protect it again. And you can't use it, right? And then what happens? Well, people in that other organization, they go and they escalate up the hierarchy, the ladder, and they go and they say to people, it's like, you know, you know we're, we're buying software from those guys over there, and they basically shut our access off to something we really need, right? So how strong do you have to be as a company before you go and say, well, yeah, but you shouldn't have been doing that? In most companies, people will go ahead and say, well, pff, customer's right, you know? I mean, you gave them access. You can't go and revoke it now. They're paying us, right? Okay, so this is something, this is a, a political dilemma which kind of arises in protection environments. And you have to go and basically look at it and ask yourself, can we really deal with this particular thing? Can we basically go ahead and say to people, yes, you know, we're making it public and stuff like that, but you shouldn't use this particular thing. Um, there's a great document about um, the Eclipse project, Eclipse in Java. Um, and I used this term a little bit earlier, but it was basically the Eclipse API rules of engagement. And they have this notion within the Eclipse API of something that they call soft final. What soft final means is that you kind of mark with a comment that a particular method or class is soft final. And what that means is I'd really like to make this final. I don't think you should use this. You shouldn't subclass this. But I'm going to go and basically leave it free because it's useful for me to go and leave it non-final, non-sealed. And then essentially, you know, it is really part of the contract that people who use this that, well, sure, you can subclass this thing. You can override this particular methods. But guess what? If it breaks later, pff, it's your problem. It's not ours. And I think that being upfront with people about that is really a rather useful thing to do. But the key thing is, you know, that really this is all social stuff. I mean, this is, you know, we want to enforce things with language mechanisms, but quite often it's a bit too tight. And it leads to people working around things in crazy ways and, and causing trouble. So the next thing, next lesson, I think, is a rather profound one. There are no requirements. There is only design. What do I mean by that? There are no requirements. There is only design. I think that we really have this strange historical artifact within software development. And what it comes down to is that we've, we've always tried to go and basically have this separation between people who articulate and people who implement, right? And um, the articulation thing, which happens in many IT shops, is about saying, look, you know, I've got this bullet list. I've got budget for this entire thing. We have these 20 features we need to go and have in our system. And guess what? That's what you need to do. And having that separation between development and the commissioning of a system is considered very normal in our industry. But the thing we have to ask ourselves is, does it really work that way in other disciplines? Here's my favorite example. I have a van made by Honda, and when my wife and I got it, we were amazed at the number of cup holders within this van. It has, I think, 11 or 12 cup holders all the way across. And we don't drink that much, right? Especially when driving, you know? So it's like you've got all these cup holders there. And you know, it's kind of funny to think about this, though. You know, did somebody inside of Honda go and say, OK, requirement for our van, 12 cup holders, four wheels, three seats, you know, and organized this way and all this stuff. Did they basically come up with a list of requirements to say, that's exactly what we need to do? And just commission it and say, that's it. Designers go run off and do this stuff. I kind of doubt that they did that, right? Because the thing is, when you think about design in the large, all these things really are, when you look at them, they are design decisions. They're not, you know, they're, they're not vehicle design decisions. They really are product design decisions, okay? You can choose to go and basically uh, decide, you know, um, how to go and make something better in the market by going and, you know, altering the number of cup holders and all this other stuff and just making the whole package. And I think that it's a much more involved design process going back and forth with these things. But we live with this artifice within software development, which is that, that you know, there's one group of people that kind of commission by features and another group of people that just kind of implement. And sometimes you can, make, you can get a win in software development by going and saying, you know, it just costs too much in design to implement that feature. What do I mean by that? Well, there are some features where when you look at them, you kind of realize it's like, okay, well, you know, for the people who are using it, that looks like what they want. But if we put this in there, it's going to cause other trouble. And it's going to end up going and degrading their experience. And as a result, we just basically choose not to go and have that requirement. Okay? You can win with that kind of design. And we see it in product design all the, all the time. You know? um, there's a story about the iPod when it was first being developed that Steve Jobs 
you know, kind of looked at this and people were going around the table and talking about what they needed and somebody said, yeah, well, we'll need an on-off button. And he's like, nope, no on-off button. Okay, just made the decision, no on-off button. And he ended up going and just really driving this design towards the most simple design that you could to go and basically encompass all this functionality and end up producing a really nice user experience for people. And I think that we're really remiss in a sense in software development um, in that we don't really think about product design in the large. But you're seeing a lot more of this now. People with user experience backgrounds kind of moving forward. Um, I've been thinking about this and talking about this for a while. Uh, Jeff Patton has been talking about this particular thing also with uh, user experience and, and how product design is really an important aspect of things. But you have to kind of look at it also from an economic point of view. You know, if um, uh, it's kind of like, you know, do we really think that the people who design our DVR controllers are really great designers? Right? Every controller for a DVR or a controller for a TV set has just an amalgam of buttons that just do crazy things and you've got to relearn them in each particular one and all the different possible settings and stuff like that. It doesn't look like anybody really designed that user experience, right? It reminds me of a lot of IT applications that I see. It's kind of like it's all designed by laundry list. And, you know, apparently somebody made the decision that that user experience thing was not all that important. But, you know, that's where you win or lose in many, in many markets is the user experience thing. Okay, another deep lesson. Names are provisional. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, I did a little bit of a talk about this earlier when I was talking about um, blind alleys and software development. So I'm not going to repeat myself too much on this. But I think that we sometimes basically place a bit too much weight on names in software development. Now, that's... You know, it's terrible to hear myself say that because I also believe the names are the most important thing in software development, one of the most important things in design. If you can find a good evocative name for a class or a method that resonates with people, then people understand how things tie together in your system. They can understand the story of how things work in the system. But quite often we look at naming itself and we think that, well, you know, once we came up with this name, we've settled it. Okay, that is it. We have, we call this thing an X in the very beginning of our project and it has to be an X from then on. I was really surprised when I saw Martin Fowler's refactoring book years and years ago and noticed that he has a refactoring that's missing. He talks about rename method in the book, but he does not talk about rename class. And it's funny because people rarely consider this one. You build an application, you come up with some abstractions, and quite often we just take those abstractions and we clutch onto them forever. It's kind of like, you know, these are our abstractions, right? And it's kind of like we, the name has infiltrated our our discourse and we have that sort of thing, but we never think about, you know, what would it be like to rename this? Could we understand our system better if we rename this class? And this is something which can come up quite often when you're refactoring, right? If you look at a class and you start to go and get a sense of its internal dependencies and you say, gee, you know, this class is really big, it has multiple responsibilities, can I take a piece of this out and pull it into a separate class? This is an opportunity not just to name that class that you're pulling out, but also to look at how that name makes you think about the other names you have in your system and possibly say, well, gee, we call this thing an X, you know, ever since we designed the system, but maybe now that we pull this responsibility out, its responsibilities have changed a little bit, and we can see it as something which is a slightly different. And, you know, it's great that refactoring tools allow us to rename classes these days. And version control is getting better. We don't have to worry quite as much about um, renaming issues in version control these days as we did with some of the earlier tools. So I'm surprised we don't do enough of this. But the thing we have to re remember is that naming is provisional. We can choose better names over time as we learn better names for things in software. And it's just one of the most powerful things you can do in software. Okay. Physical architecture shapes logical architecture. I expect some pushback on this one. But I think it's rather interesting. It's rather true. Um, we often tend to go and look at things and say, you know, we just have this logical idea, this domain, and we're going and building things up, and then kind of defer considerations about how we're going to tie these things together in multiple servers and all these other things. Um, and quite often that can work out okay. You can do certain bits and basically keep them rather, you know, physical structure independent and, and use abstraction well so we don't have to care about where we put particular things. But I think there's a deeper thing going on also. And that's that, you know, Within software development, technology does drive us much more than we consider that it does. There are a lot of things that are possible now that have been possible for a long period of time, but it's only been with a couple of people, a couple of organizations kind of stepping in and saying, look, you know, we can do things this way. We can organize systems in this particular way with this particular physical architecture. 
And that kind of sometimes chooses for us or helps us choose different problems to solve. Okay, take a look at MapReduce on Google. Okay, so which came first, MapReduce or the problem? I'd, I'd argue that the problem came first. We wanted to go, or they, I knew Google wanted to go and do, you know, um, really massive par parallel operations. And they basically arrived at this architecture to allow them to do those things. But ever since they came up with that, there have been lots of people looking at various different problems and saying, well, you know, it's like, oh, okay, we've got this technology MapReduce. How can we exploit it, right? And then they start to think about different problems that they can solve, different things that they can do. And um, as a result, go ahead and sort of, uh, you know, um, put different things in market just because the technology is available to do these things. And the technology quite often is, implement, is uh, intimately tied with a physical architecture. You know, we see this with Twitter. Twitter was an interesting idea, but it seemed like over time, due to scaling reasons, they had to go and basically change their APIs for various things. It's like if you look at the whole big um, reply dilemma, which has occurred over the past, what, couple of months. You know, they've changed the way that replies work in Twitter. And, you know, a lot of that is really based upon their physical architecture, you know, things which are not all that easy to go and solve in a nice, scalable way. So they said, let's, let's change the problem a little bit. I think that there's a lot more of this that happens than we really want to go and cr give credit to. Many physical decisions that we have and physical availability of certain architectures can influence the types of problems that we solve in software development and also, in, um, also uh, influence the types of, um, of uh, product that we actually end up with. Ever hear of this one at all? Conway's Law? Okay, some people have heard of this. Not too many people have heard of this. It's something which is getting a lot more play now. To me, this is one of the deepest truths in software development. So let's go and see it from in his own words. Melvin Conway said this in 1968. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are physical, which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So I see some smiles. How many people have just seen this today? Conway's Law. Bunch of people. Okay. This is a really, really terribly insightful statement about design. Okay. And I see this over and over again in consulting. You basically notice that, well, you got this design, you look at it in UML, you look at the package structure and all this stuff, and you can kind of see it's like pff, they had one team working on this over here and another team working on this over here, right? And it's just true. You s when, as people have um, tighter communication, the work that they end up doing ends up being more cohesive, and so it ends up being seen as like a separate component, okay? Um, and uh, I'll never forget this. One... Uh, Long time ago, I worked with this at this company, and I was working in the research department. We were working on some um, some heuristics and algorithms for going and doing classification of various things. And I visited a team that was going and using our stuff, and they had this big diagram, and it's like all the package structure of all their code. And then here was our stuff way out here. We, they had our package and a big long line, okay. And we actually worked in a different building. And then me and a friend of mine, Victor, we were transferred over into the production area and to help them go and integrate all this stuff. Without anybody saying anything about it at all, our package moved closer to the rest of the packages in the diagrams, right? It just seemed like it was, everybody kind of thought it's like, okay, well, you're part of us now, right? Okay. But this is a very powerful thing when you think about it. And this really has something which is, you know, you have to really think about. When you make team decisions, when you make decisions about how to allocate people across teams, what you are doing also is you are making architectural decisions. Even if you don't think that you are, okay? Because... The ease of communication in, in, in what people do is going to affect the way that they choose to go and reuse code, the way that you choose to go and build dependencies among many different things. So it's kind of a nice thing to go and be aware of. If you, if you design an organization in the right way, your architecture can be better. Architecture influences organization, and organization influences architecture. And it's a rather deep, profound statement. I think the thing that is most interesting to me about this is that this goes and gets us out of a box in a way. I think that sometimes... We like to think of design as if it's like this thing that we do, and we don't really think about the external things that happen around us impinging upon that. But the thing is that there are many forces that lead to design. Not all of them are under our control directly unless we're aware of them. If we are aware about the fact that team structure goes and affects the structure of software, we can choose to go and organize our teams differently and basically go and achieve different effects within organizations. One last thing to say about this is that there's been an awful lot of talk in the industry about feature teams recently. Am I working on a feature team? Okay. There's like the notion of component teams, right? You work on a particular component and you get all of your work done and then you package your component, you hand it off to another team that uses your component and they go on and they do their things. In agile software development, many people are talking about feature teams, which is really that you have a group of people 
they work together as a team and they can touch any part of the software they want to in order to go and solve feature problems and go and add features into the code base. And what happens with that? It can work out if people are very diligent about things, but when you think about it, isn't that, it's kind of like in economics, the tragedy of the commons. You ever hear of this at all? It's like this notion that if you have a big park and everybody owns the park, then nobody's going to really take care of it because everybody kind of feels, well, somebody else will do that. And the park becomes like a dumping ground and nobody really goes and takes care of it. And the same thing can happen to a code base. If you really don't have any feeling of ownership in a particular area of code, it's easy to make decisions which over the long term tend to evaporate good design. Okay? The ideal thing for all of us is to go and all feel that we all own all parts of the code. But there is the, this issue of human scale also. I mean, it's really hard to go and feel ownership in a 15 million line code base, a very particular piece that you touch. So it feels like there's still this thing that if you, if you can establish zones where people can feel like, you know, I'm coming back to this tomorrow, so I definitely want to make sure that this thing is still working the way I expect it to. I want to go and have design here that I can count on for the next 15 you know, months or something along those lines. That sense of ownership really helps us when we're going and making decisions in the code base. Another deep thing, you can finesse away error handling with good design. Does that sound radical? How many people do error handling? Yeah, we have to, right? Otherwise the errors propagate up to the users and they get really upset with us. How do you handle errors? Well, keep them from the user, right? Do whatever you can. Log files, do all these other things. You're going to keep track of you know, what's bad happened and you know, just try to recover when we can. It's a rather deep subject, error handling. Uh, but the thing to point out about it, though, is that there are things you can do that people don't really talk about very much with regard to error handling. One of the things gets back to that type thing that we were talking about a little bit earlier. If you look at software and say that we have um, types are really sets of values, you should be aware of places in your design where you have a, a superset of things going into an area where you can't really accept all those values, right? And if you can't accept all those values in a particular area, then you have the possibility of errors. To give you like a really simple example of this, strings, okay? I can't tell you the number of times I visit teams and what they do is they have like a little mini language built into their application where they go and produce strings in one area, then they parse them and use them in another area of your code. And that can be okay. The only thing about it though is that strings are a damn wide data type, right? You can put anything into a string that you want to. And what happens when you make a mistake and on the other end you go and say, okay, well, yeah, it looks like it wasn't really formed correctly. What do I do now, right? this other part of the system encoded information in a string and it's not really right over here. You've basically made the system brittle by going in and introducing the possibility of an error across this bridge inside the system. So what can you do? You know, first off, just don't make errors, don't correct errors. But you are also, by using a data type that wide, going and giving yourself the possibility of errors and then when you have the possibility of errors, you have to figure out what is your recovery strategy? What happens when the XML is malformed and gets over to this side? Chances are it wasn't something that the user introduced through their actions. It's something that a programmer introduced by going and making a mistake in one part of the application and having a part of the system which is less tolerant accepting the mistake. So we can finesse away errors. We just have to be rather diligent about it. Another important thing, error policy is as important as the main line. I, I'm just going to reiterate this. We have not thought enough about error handling in the industry. I'm sure many of you have seen patterns of very, for various different topics and domains within software development. I have not yet seen a book on error handling patterns. Okay? Quite often people make the assumption that, well, you know, if you have try-catch, it's like, okay, you've got all the error handling that you need. But it really is a rather deep subject. Some applications have different policies than others. In some applications, you want to fail fast if there's a problem because you have a support desk, and the support desk is going to go ahead and turn around to the developers and say, look, we have a production problem solve it. And they can solve it in five minutes because they're just trained to just dig into those things and go forward. Other software is shrink wrap or it goes and gets embedded in devices and you have exactly the opposite policy. The policy is we never crash, right? We have to stay running. So if something bad happens, what we have to do is we have to, we have to basically take corrective and recovery action within the context of our code. And when you think about it, these are really radically different approaches, not just to error handling, but also to design. You have to think about this and how it's going to go and basically propagate itself through the entire design that you're producing. And quite often we just tend to look at error handling as being like, ah, pff, error handling. We'll think about that later. Let's think about the main course first. Okay? You have to go and basically think about this rather deeply within the code, context of the code. One important policy in many systems, 
is to go and catch errors at boundaries and go and try to keep them from uh, propagating through the system. Um, I like to do this with teams quite often. We discover that, well, you know, we can, when we go and we open a socket, we can have a socket error, and we can have this happen and this happen and this happen. And if we're able to go and catch all the possible errors that relate to that there and patch things up in a particular way, we can continue processing. But what we really want to do is we want to go and take the errors that are possible over here and keep them over here, keep them at the boundary, and then have this part of the system which really doesn't have to care about these errors because we've been able to patch things up in a good way. Have you ever heard of the null object pattern at all? Anybody ever hear of this at all? This is one pattern which really should have been put in the um, early patterns literature that it took a while for people to kind of recognize it as being decent. Um, here's an example of this in Ruby. We have a class called program class, and we have a class called null program class. Um, let me tell you the context of this. Um, I worked on an IDE a long time ago for Python. And uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting in developing IDEs is that you quite often have these little panes where you say, okay, here's a list of all, all the packages, and here's a list of all the classes, and here's a list of all the methods in each particular class. You click on a class, and you get a list of all its methods in the pane, right? Think about the code that you would go and write to do something like this. You're going to have a reference someplace to the list of things you're going to place inside the methods pane, okay? And whenever you select a class, it's going to go ahead and refresh, and it's going to go and take a list of all those methods and go and display them. Right? So what happens if there is no class selected in the class pane? What should you show in the method pane? Well, what you could do is you could say, well, that reference could be pointing at nil or it could be pointing at null. So I'll just always check that reference and say, well, if it's null, I won't put anything in, in my um, pane at all. If it's not equal to null, then I know it's pointing to a list. I can go and get all those methods and go and put them in the, in the list box that I've got there. But there's an easier way of doing this, and that's to go and introduce a null object. What we have here is a separate class which behaves like the real one, program class. This one here is called null program class. What it does is it returns an array that's empty whenever you ask it for its methods. So we can really finesse this thing within our code by going and saying, look, you know, we have a reference to the class, and we're always going to go and go to that class and get all the methods, and we're going to go and list them in the list pane. It's just that sometimes that reference will be pointing to the null program class. And other times, we'll be pointing at the real one, which is going to give you a real array of those methods. Okay? So we never have to check for null. Okay? We just have this thing, which is always pointing at a valid object, and we just go and say, hey, class, I don't care whether you're real or not, just give me a list of the methods. And sometimes it's empty. And sometimes it's pointing at a real class, and it gives you the real list of the methods. So it's a little bit of a trick. And sometimes people don't really like this trick because they think it's a little bit deceptive in your code base. But tell you what, I mean, do you have any null checks in your code? Right. This is pandemic, okay, within the software development industry, having checks inside your code for null. And when you think about it, it's like, you know, if you just didn't pass null any place, you probably wouldn't have to check for it every place, right? That's a really easy thing to say when you're dealing with a very large code base and it sounds kind of brash. But really, when you are designing systems from scratch, and we are designing areas of systems from scratch, if you have the rule that we never pass null, or anytime we get null, we convert it to something else, you don't have to do much null checking. It's just not going to happen. And it's just a tenant of clean code. Logging is a first class design consideration. I've always hated logging. Okay? This is really a strange admission to make because we know it's practical. We know that we need to go and log things in many applications just to find out what happened when we have a crash. But it's always annoyed me that when you have um, some otherwise clean code, you just have a lot of the logic kind of punctuated by, uh, if the log is not equal to null, set this up, create this warning flag, and do this sort of thing. And you just end up going and doing that over and over and over again, and you've obscured the flow of the code. You don't really see what the logic is anymore because you have all these embedded logging statements. I think it's powerful for us to go and actually look at logging itself as if it is a business requirement, right? And to really go and take care of it as a real design consideration in our code. And what do you do when you do this? Then you start going and thinking about the, the more general thing. Is it really logging or is it notification of a particular event that people are interested in? Can we find particular areas of the code where logging can be done and then not really worry about logging in the other areas of the code because we have enough information at that point? When you really think about it as a design challenge to avoid the propagation of logging statements throughout the code, then you end up being, you know, you end up going and producing something which is much more intelligible and much easier to deal with. Um, there's a good rant on this in an upcoming book called Growing Object-Oriented Software D Surrounded by Tests by Steve Freeman and Nat Price. It's um, undergoing final review right now, but they basically talk about this and show examples of how to do logging well in applications and um, how to avoid it from going and propagating all the way through the code base and 
becoming problematic for you. Okay, this is a strange one. It took me a long time to see this. Databases are good for more than storing data. People enjoy databases? Yeah, well, okay, that's good. I mean, uh, to me, I'm like, ah, yeah. It's like there's always that, that, you know, the mapping layer where you're trying to map them to objects or not and dealing with the, you know, the fact that your table layout is different than what you want things to be in programs and stuff like that. Um, I never really appreciated databases until I encountered a team which didn't really use one much. Okay? Uh, this team had a very large application, and I remember being stunned with some friends you know, um, that I visited, that went there with, and we were looking at the code, and we realized that we had really horrible dependency problems. We had this, if you caught up an object, it ended up having all these sub-objects, and other sub-objects, and other sub-objects, and other sub-objects, and you ended up having this issue. Okay? You ever hear of the law of Demeter at all? Okay? It's kind of like the notion that an object should not return another object back to you because then you're dependent upon that object in addition to being dependent upon the original one. And you can often see this happen when you have like this, this train wreck of calls. You have an entity, dot entity, dot entity, and you make a call. And in that context, you're now dependent upon that entire path traversal. What happens when that path changes? Well, you've got to go through and you've got to change a whole mess of code when you basically change the path of these things because you've incurred a lot of dependency by going and allowing this access of things to all the way down in your code. But this code really, really had a lot of this stuff. And I just was really kind of stunned. And it took me a long time to realize what was going on. But the way things were working is that when this system came up and somebody go logged on the system, their information was loaded in memory. Not just some of their information. All of their information was loaded in memory. So in essence, you had this huge tree of all the objects people might ever really want to go and use in the system. You know, and you have this big thing. And of course, you ended up having all these deep references down into things and stuff like that. Think about what happens in a normal database application. Okay? You go to some service which is going to go and give you an object, and that object may not be everything you would need in every business context, but it's an object with the things it's configured for that are local to your particular context. Okay? So it's kind of nice if you start to, if you ever work in a situation where you don't have a database, you might get into this thing where it's like you've got these really deep nests of objects and you're kind of overwhelmed by the complexity because you haven't really been forced by the database to go and constrain what, you, what you're getting in memory. Um, a reason I like to think about this recently is because we're getting closer and closer to a world where people aren't using databases quite as much as they have in the past. RAM is getting cheaper. You can have hundreds of gigabytes of RAM in memory and keep lots of interesting data available to you in memory, and you don't have to go and really hit the database all that much. Um, but we have to be aware of the fact that uh, there is a discipline to using databases, and that discipline often goes and makes dependency more manageable for us. And we need to be able to go and have that kind of discipline even if we don't have massive databases. You know. um, one thing to mention with this, too, is that there are some great patterns that can kind of help you out with uh, these things of nested tangled objects. There's the aggregate pattern in Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design, which is really worth looking at. Okay, the last one. I talked about this a little bit earlier today, and I really apologize to people who have seen me speak several times today and you know, wonder why I keep ranting on this. But I think it's a rather interesting insight about object orientation. I feel that objects want to be asynchronous. What does that mean? Objects want to be asynchronous. I mean, how do we go and sort of assign intentionality to an object, right? They're just things, right? They don't have intentions. But it's really an interesting thing to think about the main thing we get from object orientation when we do it well is decoupling. Okay? The ability to, to have things interact with minimal dependency. Okay? And um, there is this tenet of software design called tell, don't ask, which was written up by the pragmatic programmers years ago. The notion that we are better off if we tell an object to do something rather than go to it and say, hey, give me this thing back and I can work with it and then I can pass it on to somebody else. When we do that, when we ask for something from somebody and we do that work and pass it on to somebody else, we're a middleman. We're basically dependent on the thing we're talking to. We're dependent upon the thing that we get. We're dependent upon the thing that we go and we pass it along to. And that's a lot of dependency. You can actually make systems which are much less dependency uh, bound by going and saying, look, you know, I do my work and I pass it on to the next guy. Here's my packet of work. You work with it. You run with it. And the cool thing is if we don't receive anything back from anybody, then our call can be asynchronous. We can just go ahead and pretty much fire and forget. And we end up having maximal decoupling within our system. The thing that I like to go and carry this back to is something that um, was uh, kind of articulated by Alan Kay, who's one of the um, 
one of the founders of object orientation. And he basically said that the metaphor behind uh, objects is really cells in biology. That when you have cells in a, in a living system, they really are very deeply decoupled from each other. And the way that works is that they basically send messages to each other. And these messages are little chemical expressions, okay? A state changes inside of a uh, cell, it forms a new chemical. The chemical goes and permeates out through the membrane, other cells go and react to it. But it's not like you're sitting there synchronously waiting, you know, for anything to happen. If you're a cell, you send out the message and maybe another message gets back to you and you react with your state a little bit differently. That's about as deeply decoupled as you can get in a system. And I think that that's really kind of powerful. We start to see this a bit more um, in, in higher level architecture. We look at components, messaging components, and we basically see it as a way of going and decoupling things. But I think that it's important to point out that that's what objects were kind of meant to be in a sense. Um, Erlang is like this. In Erlang, every process is kind of like an object. It sends messages to other processes. So anyway, um, those were the things I had. Those are what I consider to be deep lessons in software design. I uh, kind of hope you enjoyed them. And I, it's really tough to go and have a topic like this because you know that there's some things people have run into and other things that people haven't. And you don't want to bore the people who have run into some of these things already. But I just hope that you found like a couple of things that maybe you hadn't encountered before and they kind of sparked your thinking about different aspects of design. So any comments or questions at all? Oh, OK, hi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It, might, it actually becomes an issue that the receiver has to deal with, right? It's like, you know, you send the message, but then basically the thing which is responding to the message has really got responsibility at that point for dealing with it if it's a, a problem, okay? So it's just, uh, it is pushing responsibility off onto the thing that you're talking to, so. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you very much. Yep.